In the room, we have William Friedkin, Bill, as he likes to be called. This gentleman has done so many wonderful things that you probably have seen. Uh, best known for the director of The Exorcist, also the director of The French Connection. He's done a lot of different things that we'll talk about here today. You expect, if you've never met the guy, you expect him to come in, the director of The Exorcist and horrifying, terrifying films. You expect him to come in with his eyes drawn back in his skull, the veins on his neck showing, fingernails very, very long, skin hanging from every part of his body. Pretty much what we expected, actually. Yeah, and and, uh, he's here now. Oh God. No, you're to it's totally different. Yeah, I, you know, I usually wear a black cape to these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but since it's Halloween and everyone else is, I thought I'd forego that. Okay, I, well, welcome to the program. Thanks a lot. Let's guys. talk. start off with The Exorcist. Um, did you know, when you read the script, did they approach you, first of all, yeah. to direct it? I, I knew Bill Blatty, who wrote the book. I, I used to see him around the racetrack, and he always used to borrow money from me. <laughs> and I, I knew him as a, you know, sort of a little deadbeat guy. Yeah. And one day I was on tour for the French Connection, and he sent me the galleys of The Exorcist. I carried them around. I'm not sure me. the galleys. The galleys are like the book before it's published. Okay. You mm -hmm. know, it's uh, the first draft of the book mm -hmm. before it's edited and then set in type. Had you done horror before that? No. No, I don't consider The Exorcist a horror film. I, I don't think of it in those terms. That's I know that other people do. It's a horrifying thing. I, I looked at it as a realistic film about unexplainable things because it is based on a true story that took place in 1949 in Silver Springs, Maryland. It's a 14-year-old boy. But Blatty uh, was an undergraduate at Georgetown when this case took place and he took 15 years to write the book. And when he sent it to me, I, I just carried it around with me from city to city. I didn't even open it. I thought, well, you know, I, what is this? Right, Finally, yeah. I had nothing to do one night. I started reading it, and that was it. I couldn't put it down. So I, now, were you imagining the images that we see on the screen in your head? I think I probably saw the picture in my head that night for the first time. I saw the whole film. You have to do that if you're making a film. You've got to envision it before you shoot it. Uh, because this film brings to mind so many images that have touched in many ways so many people, well, we have to ask uh, questions like this. W were you involved in the storyboarding? Did you want... You I never storyboard. I, I, you don't. You know, I, what I do is I have meetings with the crew and the cast. Mm -hmm. We talk about what we're going to do and then go out and do it. I try to demystify it as much as I can. And, uh, you know, once I know what the film is and I see it in my mind's eye, then I can take suggestions from people and change it. Because the suggestions will either be better, hopefully, you know, or enhance what my own ideas were. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you're sitting there and you're reading through this, this script. It was uh, a novel then, uh, Mark. Yeah, it was a novel at the time that he sent it to me. That We didn't have a script. All right, so you're reading through, and as a director, uh, as Brian just mentioned, you begin to get these mental pictures. Do you, for a lack of a better word, do you at some point become horny to make this movie? This is something you know you can put on the screen. Yeah, that's, that's very well put. You know, uh, I felt that I had it inside of me. I could put it out there. And so that in, after I read it, I called Blatty. I said, Jesus is incredible. He said, you want to make the film? I said, absolutely, let's do it. Now, at what point, I mean, you're reading through, and you're grabbed, I'm assuming, from the beginning of the first, first chapter. First sentence. And are you hoping that it doesn't go crappy, or you're, you're, please <laughs> let it be as good as this first part has been. Please let the end be great. Yeah, and it, you, that's what you have always when you read a script, because most of them do go bad. You get into yeah. a good idea, and then whoop, right yeah. over the waterfall. Yeah. But this, at a certain point, it just kicked in, and I knew it was going to sustain. I didn't know how he'd take it out, but I, it, you knew you were in the hands of a good driver about a third of the way through. Now, hmm. you know, you, you put... In this film, you put some very frightening, very controversial things on film. Never seen them before the, things. Mm -hmm. You know, Reagan stands up on the bed with the cross and, mm -hmm. and, and masturbates with it and, mm -hmm. and shouts these profanities. Were there concerns uh, by yourself, by the, the movie company, by the people involved that they, we, we can't do this? This yeah. is... When they said, most of the studios didn't want to make it, but Warner Brothers did want to make it, and they were really hot for it at the time. But then once they sent me off to do it, I guess they sort of put their fingers in their ears and, you know, good that they eyes. did. A lot of times that wouldn't and, happen. And ducked. You yeah. Know. <laughs> they let me make it the way I wanted to make it. Then there was a, a lot of fear that the ratings board would chop it up once we finished. But, and they thought it would give it an X. But then, a half hour after the ratings board saw it, I had a call from the guy who was running it then, and he said, we've seen the picture, we think it's terrific, 
we're going to give you an R rating, no cuts, oh, good. which Whoa. was not expected. No, no cuts. He, no cuts. He said, you know, we're going to take a lot of heat for that, and so are you, but we think it's worth it. And that was, that's the way they ran the board then. Now they just run scared behind everything. Sure, sure. But the guy who ran it then uh, was was really an intelligent guy, and he, he could see what the film's power was. You know, one of the things that makes the movie great is the not only the script, of course, the words that were written on the page, but the uh, the role played by the mother and... Um, yeah. Uh, Ellen Burstyn. Oh, my God. Yeah. She's done some other really great things, but she was so strong in that. And Linda. You guys have had Linda on a lot. Yes. I know I've heard her on here. Yeah. Should I tell you how I met Linda and how she was cast? Yeah. I haven't great. talked about this much, but, you know, I interviewed. I, I lost track of it. I must have interviewed about 500 girls, and then there were thousands who never got to me. All right, let me ask you. In this point, you were interviewing these girls. What were you looking for as a director? Intelligence, number one, and a kind of personality that could roll with anything. That was the key to it. She had to be able to grasp it, and she had to be able to deal with it, because it took 10 months to make the film. You're auditioning wow. how old? How old are these girls you're auditioning? They were 11, 12, some were a little older, but mostly 11 and 12. I didn't want an older girl yeah. to get younger. I wanted a 12-year-old girl. She and was 11 when to I ha it. To have this girl grasp what you're talking about, I'm not sure I could. Well, here was our first meeting. This is the way it went. Uh, and, and I had a similar meeting with other girls, but it never got this far because, uh, you know, they couldn't cut it. You could see right away you shouldn't even, you know, thank them and next case. But when Linda came in the room, I, I how are you? She's a bright, funny little girl, and she was a straight-A student. And, and I said to her, so, do you know what The Exorcist is about? She said, sure. I said, what is it? She said, well, it's about um, a little girl who gets possessed by the devil, and then she does a lot of bad things. I said, what sort of things? So, oh, well, she pushes somebody out of a window, and then she hits her mother across the face, and then she masturbates with a crucifix. She, and, <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, do, you, do you know what that means? She, she said, sure, it's like uh, jerking off, isn't it? And I said, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that'd be what it is. Uh -huh. And yeah. I said, uh, have you ever done that? And she said, Sure, haven't you? <laughs> and I said, you are hired. Inker. You are hired. I'll take because her. Because she was the only one who could deal with it on that, you know, superficial a level. Right. And that's what it took. After every take that we did of some of the most outrageous stuff, there was a prop man standing right next to her, and he would hand her a milkshake. And there are all these photographs of her sucking on this milkshake. In the right? green makeup. In the, the green makeup wow. and, uh, and uh, looking like that. What a trooper. Now... She was and is. We if wanna... it wasn't for her being the way she was, no one could ever think of making a film like that. So intense and so very heavy. We read the stories and heard the rumors uh, when this movie came out and horrified everybody who had seen it. Uh, it was fun to talk about the rumors that there were deaths on the set, weird things that were happening while the film was being e made. Even the last week or so, we've been promoting your visit. We've gotten calls from people that have given uh, some of those stories. And Did rumors. they die? Anybody die when you announced that? One was from the beyond. One yes, call, I believe. Yes. Call and collect. Uh -huh. Hard to hear. Uh, yeah, but nobody immolated themselves in the control room. <laughs> no? Cool. Were, were Are you still on the air, by the way? <laughs> A lot of times I go on and uh, the, the whole thing lights out. Really? I tell you, when the film opened in Rome, which of course is the spiritual home of the exorcist, mm -hmm. when the film opened in Rome, it was, a, it was a, a driving rainstorm. And the film opened in a little theater in one of the old squares of Rome that was surrounded by a big church. There was a little theater and some shops in the corner, and the rest of the square was all this ancient church, 1,300 years old. How poetic. And it was a driving rainstorm, and so help me, lightning hit the crucifix, the, the cross. Stop it. On the church that night, it was a gigantic metallic cross that had been there, you know, for hundreds of years, and it hit the cross and knocked it down, and it fell into the square, and because it was a big rainstorm with lightning and thunder, there weren't a lot of people around. But had there been, it would have killed many. My and, God. And then they wrote about it like, you know, people wanted to say, well, this must be a publicity stunt or something. Mm. But, yeah, we got this church to have that happen. Made <laughs> <laughs> them big dollars. Kind of tough, I would think, too. Anything on the set, though? Anything, any bizarreness, weirdness? Well, the one thing that did happen was uh, one night, I, it was 4 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from the production manager. I was at home, and he said, don't bother to come to work today. I said, why, am I fired? He said, no. He said, the set burned to the ground. 
and, and we have no idea why. The, the house was a, was a big set we built on a sound stage in New York. It was three stories. We built a full house that you could move around in. Wow. And it, the set cost a half a million dollars, and it had real paintings on it. You know, they weren't yeah. fake. And, and um, one morning... For no apparent reason, there was a guard outside the door. He saw smoke coming through the control room door. Opened the door. The whole set was in flames. There was nobody in the set. And um, the theory was, you know, no one knew how this happened, but the theory was that because it was an old studio, there were pigeons flying around in the rafters and that a, a pigeon might have flown into a light box. Yeah, sure, William. There's a pigeon. <laughs> That's what I thought. I, I mean, there, were, there was no reason, but the insurance company, well, they'd shut us down for like three months. We had to rebuild it. Well, let me, let me ask you then. Uh, were there protesters during the... No. There weren't? No. Protesting what? Well, they read the book. They didn't think it should be made into a film. Oh, the, uh, I was thinking, the could times they have... were not as politically correct as mm. they are now, Brian. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a different time. No, there were never any protests that I know of about The Exorcist, although, you know, there were a lot of people freaked out by it mm -hmm. after the fact. Mm -hmm. But when, we, when I first saw it with an audience, when we finished it, and then the next day it went into the National Theater out mm -hmm. here. And you're sitting in the audience. I was in the last row, and nobody moved. There was not a pin drop. Nobody got up, got a popcorn or anything. No, they didn't have to. They did it in their seats. But I didn't hear it, really. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I didn't hear anything, and I thought, uh-oh, disaster. There's no reaction, whatever. Then I started to hear all these stories of people throwing up yeah. and running out and all that. I never saw that. Right. But uh, I did see it with an audience, and I thought, geez, it's not getting over. You know, you were expecting moans and scary noises. And More visceral reactions, yeah. yeah. And that did not happen. It happened later. Yeah. People were shocked uh, to the point they might not could have moved, because I really, remembering back when I saw it, I saw it in this old theater. Where was that? Russellville, Alabama. Uh -huh. And like the, the, the audio would ring through the thing. But the, the moment that she stood up on the bed with the cross and began the masturbation, mm -hmm. I, it really at that point, and I love horror, mm -hmm. I really thought I had bitten off more than I could chew here, and I really didn't think I was going to be able to finish it up. And what, you know, is I think back now, it's been years since I've seen it, but moments that made the film as intense as it was were little bitty things that probably weren't in the book that you added, mm -hmm. like the power of the demon that had possessed this little girl mm -hmm. slammed the bedroom door and cracked it. I'll tell you where that came. That wasn't in the book, but that came from... I, I talked to the aunt of the boy who actually was the subject of this case. He was a 14-year-old boy in Silver Spring, Maryland in 1949. And I talked to his aunt, and she told me those, like the dresser moving in the room and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I saw in the archives at Georgetown not only the diaries of the priests uh, and nuns who were in attendance, but doctors and nurses who were there who kept diaries. And in the archives of Georgetown, they have these diaries. And when I read this stuff, I knew that we were dealing with something that was, um, you know, not a horror film. It was something just really unexplainable. You talk about mm -hmm. the boy, 14, mm -hmm. in 1949. Does he still live today? He's still around. He has no memory of what happened to him. You never so, talked to no, him? No, I, I could have, but I, I, I didn't want to. You know, because there was the fear that if somebody had told him about the book and then the movie, that it might cause him to revert back or something. There was a legitimate concern that we not even tell him that the picture was out there. So I spoke at length to his aunt, who was a totally together woman. They were not a Catholic family. Uh, the, this young man was going through the... The case was reported widely in the Washington Post in 1949. And the people were... Um, they didn't understand what this guy was going through. They tried every kind of medicine that was around in psychiatry, and finally someone suggested the Catholic Church and exorcism. And the exorcism in that case took place over, I, I think, a, a three-week period, and he was restored to normal. He, he leads a normal life today. He has no recollection after, immediately after he was restored to normal? That's what they tell me, hmm. his, his relatives and the people who knew him. As I say, I'd never met him, and... and uh, I would like to meet him now, I guess, but... Um, I wonder if he's seen it. I don't know that. Yeah. I, I didn't want to find out, because there was this fear that in seeing it, it could flip him. But then, I had tapes sent to me from the Vatican. Uh, I had a tape of an actual exorcism in Latin in the Vatican. 
and it was a very crude little tape. It was mm -hmm. made on an old Wallensack recorder of this entire... Actually, you couldn't understand the Latin. Some of the words were... Bl but you heard this voice of, of... That was a young girl. The voice on that tape was so terrifying, even though badly... Re I'd never heard anything like it, and I, I took some of that, and I mixed it in to the actual to the soundtrack of The Exorcist. It's underneath there, along with a lot of other sounds. You know, you chose Mercedes uh, Cambridge to do the voice. Mm -hmm. Now, you could have gotten a lot of different deep, guttural voices. Yeah. Why her? Why a woman? Why... Okay. I was a fan of dramatic radio when, ever since I was a kid. She was an, a radio actress. Mm -hmm. And... Um, very famous radio actors and dramatic radio is the most exciting medium there is you know because it's all in your imagination it's right. no inch television mm -hmm. you know you just have to think about what you're hearing mm -hmm. she was a big radio star I initially went to a guy you may have heard of to do the voice I knew him from Chicago Ken Nordeen have you ever heard of him word jazz, word jazz right mm -hmm. he has like the best vo announcer voice in the world and it's deep and resonant, and he does he, word jazz, he does tricks and things. I went to Ken, and I had him dub a track, and I heard it, and it was very scary, but it was a man's voice. Mm -hmm. And the first time I heard it, and I, and I put it up on the screen uh, against the little girl images, I thought, this is, this is a man's voice. I don't care how scary. And I thought, what, what am I really looking for? I'm looking for a voice that is neutral that is neither male nor female. And I was trying to think, wh who has that voice? And I remembered from radio, Mercedes McCambridge. Mm -hmm. She hadn't done a film in a long time, but then she was doing this play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, in Dallas, Texas. So I sent for her, brought her in, screened the film for her. She was a very deep Catholic. And when she saw the film, she flipped. She, mm. she um, had not been drinking, and she stopped drinking, and she had to have a couple of priests come in while we were doing the track. They were there at all times. But she asked me to do things with her during the recording that were that was never filmed, but it was some of the most bizarre stuff. What kind of make it? She wanted to be tied to the chair, which I did. I tied her to a chair tightly. Cool. She um, uh, had straight shots of whiskey and raw eggs, and she started smoking again. She said if... She quit smoking and drinking, but she said, I've, to get my voice where you want it, I've got to try and do this stuff. So we would give her this whiskey straight and cigarettes. She was like 30 cigarettes, you know, in four hours. And th weird things started to happen with her voice naturally. It doubled up. She would, she would wheeze, and there would be three voices coming out of her just naturally. My God. Or she'd say something, and her, the timber would crack. And we recorded that for about a month, where she literally came in every morning, had counseling from these priests, and, uh, and we'd go 12, 14 hours and record stuff, try stuff, throw it out. And then weird things, as I say, would happen. Her voice would break off into three or four parts while she was just doing it. As the, as the director, were you the choices you made, did you make those choices on uh, what frightens William Friedkin? No, and what was, seemed real to me. The whole struggle there was to make this as plausible as possible. There you go. Now, up to a point, you know, when she goes off the bed and stuff, that's implausible, but I wanted to set a climate for the audience where there were just little details along the way that would prepare you for something um, out of this, out of the ordinary to happen. Do you know what made the levitation from the bed? You know, you had already set it up that this was something out of this world that was happening here, but it still was real. It still could maybe happen. Mm -hmm. When she began to levitate from the bed, there was no soundtrack, there was no music. The only thing you could hear was the chanting of the priest, and you heard the sound of a body lifting off of a bed, the springs lifting up a little bit. That's what made it so real, is that everything came to dead silence. It's like, well, if you want somebody to hear you, whisper. Mm. That's right. That's what made it so good. That's right. Yeah. It's so strange that... Um, now, Bill knows that I've never... Yeah, you've never seen I've, it. I've never seen it. Yeah. That's just a little too close. It just a little... It bothers me. Sid why, satanic r religious devil uh, no no I'm not overly religious I, uh, I don't consider myself I believe in God but I don't uh, uh -huh. I, I, that would bother me I know what I've seen pic uh, movies concerning that 
much on a less scale, much less mm -hmm. a scale that I, that I will dream about and still do dream about. So mm -hmm. I knew I couldn't see that personally. There are so many people in my shoes that haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. But the point is that that affected this country or this culture mm -hmm. so much that, you know, I've seen magazine pictures. I've seen mm -hmm. clips from the movie. I know basically the whole story and when what happened. Uh, and you'd hear tubular bells come on mm -hmm. the radio because it was kind of a hit then, and I would get totally freaked along with my friends. Yeah, that's because people are always ready to, to try and absorb something that deals with the mystery of faith. That's what drove it, mm -hmm. not as a horror mm -hmm. film. You know, people had seen the scariest horror films before that and, and since then, but they ha have not had the same effect because they weren't dealing with it on the spiritual level. And I felt that was more important than the horrific level. That is what I meant by saying is a little too close. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, I yeah, know. It's under the skin. Mm -hmm. I agree. I saw the film, and uh, I was about 17 or 18, maybe, and I was so deeply affected by what I saw. And I was already, I had already seen Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show say, it's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. I was already ready. I knew it was going to be scary. Mm -hmm. But I went in, and I went to another level of being horrified. I didn't go home. I drove around. I went to a hmm. compact food mart because I knew they had a horror fan magazine section. Hmm. And all I wanted to see was a, a, a few pictures of the little girl in the bed with a camera point, so I could see uh -huh. the back. I would know that it was a movie. <laughs> and I really didn't want to go home. I knew that my parents were already asleep. I would be alone. The, they weren't actually sleeping on their mattresses. <laughs> Levitating yeah. six feet above them. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it flipped out a lot of people. Everyone has a story yeah. about it without even seeing the movie. My dad saw it. And mm -hmm. uh, my bedroom's uh, directly <sighs> above his. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, the night he saw it, I heard his voice come, down from, uh, come up from downstairs. And he screamed, Brian! And I'm like, what? Quit moving around up there! <laughs> really? And I'm laying in bed. I said, Dad, I'm in bed. Oh, Okay. He goes back to bed and I'm like, oh, great. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> what is moving around up here? You know, it's really unique in that this is something, this is a project you did 20 years ago almost. Just yeah. about 20 yeah, years. Yeah, right. And we're still exactly. talking about this like it was yesterday. And people, for the most part, fans of film maybe have never been as horrified as they were by this movie. You know, I'll tell you something that I, that I have not spoken much about. But at, about 10 years ago, I wanted to reshoot the ending of the film. And I went back to Warner Brothers and told them what I wanted to do, and they said, great, go ahead and do it. And we'll put it out again, and, you know, we'll say it as a new ending. Cool. What had happened was that I'd been getting all of these letters, or I'd meet people around the world, and they'd say that they felt that the ending was, was negative, that it was saying that there was evil, the, the evil was still out in the street. And this bothered me, because I, I never could feel that about it. So I started to think about how could I... How could I um, change that? And I came up with an ending. If, you haven't seen the film, Brian, but it, it ends now with a priest standing over a flight of steps, an empty flight of steps, mm -hmm. where his friend, another priest, had plunged to his right, death the right. night before. Yeah. And this one, the, the surviving priest looks down the empty steps, and then he turns his back on the scene and starts to walk away, and the film ends right there. What I wanted to do about 10 years ago was go back to that location, and I wanted to film, instead of the empty steps, the dead priest coming back up the steps. And I would have used Jason Miller, who played Father Karras, and what a in, a long shot, like in, a, in a long shot, so you would not go close on him, but to give the idea of resurrection, which was the film was really um, leading toward th th throughout the, the early part of the story everything about it is pointing toward resurrection and a positive message I went back to the location to see if I could do that and the whole location had changed people had taken bricks out of the steps oh, really? they took posts out of the fence graffiti all over the place so we couldn't do it but I wished that I would it was able to put that ending on it because I think it would have been even more um, of an enriching experience. I'd love to. I'd love to see it because it is about resurrection. It would have been happy ending, kind of. Yeah, or at least a more thoughtful and provocative ending, mm -hmm. and hopefully one that would not suggest that we're dealing with evil in the street. Yeah. Uh, we've sat here and we've talked for thirty minutes about one film that you have done, 
And the fact of the matter is, by many uh, standards, it isn't necessarily your best. So we're going to take a bit of a station break. We'll sure. come back and we'll talk about many of the other things. Yes, I've sure. seen French Connection so many times. That so, didn't scare you? Uh, not really, no. Okay. No, but it was a fabulous movie. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to you about the contrast of that and other projects you've done. Okay. Okay. Pleasure. And plus we have listeners. You know I'm phone. a fan of the show. Every, I drive my son to school in the morning. He's 10 years old, and he listens to it. He loves it, you know. He lo and he, all, he wants to, you know, be in the freeway love connection and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, that'd be great. I keep That's telling a great him, idea. I tell him to wait till he's 11. You know? Yeah. Uh, let, let us have, before we do this, has your 10-year-old seen The Exorcist? Uh, he's seen parts of it because inevitably stuff comes on, you know, they'll show scenes yeah. from it or something. That's how. And he talks to his friends. It's, they all know about it, and some of his friends at school have seen it, but... But I haven't uh, run it for him yet. Uh, you know, I just finished uh, running Deep Throat for him, so I don't want yeah, to... Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> the contrast of that would be difficult. Uh, I don't want to push him too far at that age. Yeah. Is it a crucifix yeah, or is it a... Yeah, you thinking about yeah. that, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I have made this, uh, such a fascinating movie and what it did, how it affected me without seeing it. I have made people like Mark, who's... A, great at telling me the horror movies because I'll sit there wide-eyed just like I'm watching on the screen. Mm -hmm. I've made people sit down and tell me everything that happened in the film, but yet I cannot go see it. I don't know why. Interesting. Well, uh, what is interesting, and I was telling Brian this a bit earlier, one of the great things I liked about Rampage, the new film that we are going to talk about that you directed and wrote the screenplay for, is that in the the really maniacal moments of the film, you didn't show necessarily what happened. You gave us all the clues we needed. And then you allowed us to use the imagination and think about, along with a few sound effects and a few of the crazy things that make up a psychotic killer, mm -hmm. and you allowed us to imagine what he was doing. And that was, I thought, more horrifying than actually seeing it like on a Friday the 13th. I'm glad you picked up on that. That's what I tried to do. Cool. All right, we'll talk about all the other stuff that he's involved with. William Friedkin on the Mark and Brian program. And by the way, Bill, when's that next show of Deep Throat? <laughs> now, uh, what is your favorite project? Do you have a favorite that you've worked on? That I've done? Uh -huh. uh, not, no, I mean, I like them all. It's, you, you go into every one of them thinking, this is it, this is the best. Uh, some of the films I've made that haven't done that well, I, I like as much as I do The Exorcist. But there's no doubt that that's the one that, that got over so big everywhere. Um, but, um, no, I, I, I made a film called Sorcerer back in 1978. That's a good one. I've seen that. That's yeah, a good one. Yeah. Two guys driving a truckload of dynamite over mm -hmm. a rickety bridge and stuff. That was the most fun to do because it was so physically challenging. But now you won the Academy Award, the, uh, mm -hmm. the nod for the very best, the ultimate of what your craft is. Did you feel as though The French Connection was your very best work? No. Uh, when we won the Academy Award, I mean, I was stunned because I then and now I think of it as a, you know, it's a pretty good little cop film, you know. Right. And, and I never thought of it as much more than that, like a B picture. And I, and I like B pictures, mm -hmm. but I never thought of it as anything that would win an award. It was, you know, out of my hands. You know, uh, 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 I rented it. I didn't see it when it ran. I rented the, and I didn't even realize you did this until uh, we read the bio, mm -hmm. but the Thin Blue Line, which was a yeah, documentary. No, approach. I didn't do that. I, I did a film called The Thin Blue Lion, uh, Line, Mark, that's different from the one that you're talking about, Errol Morris's film oh, about Randall Adams. Okay. I made a film, another documentary called The Thin Blue Line before I ever made a feature. This is back in the 60s. Oh, okay. And this was for the ABC Network and uh, Walper, Dave Walper. And it was really about law enforcement across the United States. It's a good title, mm -hmm. you know. But his film is completely different. It's, it's good. You've seen it. I did thoroughly enjoy it. Oh, yeah. The approach at which they Excellent. Took. But they're different projects. Okay. Rampage opens nationwide today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you wrote this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the boy next door, grows up, everybody loves him, mm -hmm. plays high school baseball and football, has the real cute girlfriend he has for six years, and they have a mm -hmm. normal relationship. Mm -hmm. And one day, uh, something clicks and he decides to go out and take care of the majority of the neighborhood. Right. And With does, a knife. Yeah, and yeah. does it. And a gun. And, it, you know, even when he went to buy the gun, he'd already in his mind, he'd made up what he was going to do, and he goes in, and he even had humor as he buys the gun. The guy says, listen, before I say the gun, I've got to ask you just a few standard questions here. Uh -huh. Have you ever been inside a mental institution? So the guy goes, let me think. 
Uh, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he has, even though he is, in my mind, obviously a psychotic, out of mm -hmm. his mind, weird individual, mm -hmm. he still is in contact with himself to where these are premeditated, well-thought-out murders that he goes through with. Yeah. But, uh still stupid in the way that he does it like he doesn't care whether he gets caught or not he just knows what he has to go do which, which I won't say but um, he wants to get caught that's part of the reason why they do it that guy in, in Rampage fits the profile of a serial killer across the board uh, like in Silence of the Lambs the Hannibal Lecter character that's a great work of fiction with a marvelous performance but there are no such people there are, the serial killer is not an evil genius uh, who's also a gourmet and an intellectual who is uh, all-powerful and plotting these mm -hmm. mass murderers from a prison cell. Mm -hmm. The serial killer, like the fellow in Rampage, like Jeffrey Dahmer, like the Night Stalker, like uh, Richard Speck, like Wayne Williams in Atlanta, these are all guys who are operating not out of a sense of power, but out of a sense of weakness and self-loathing and self-disgust. And a part of it is that they want to be caught. This guy wanted to be caught. So my film is really an examination of what is an insanity defense. You know, w w how do we know what was going on in a guy's mind when he did something in the past? See, that's the thing in the film in that after this guy has been caught for doing all of these murders, it's obvious that he did them. He confesses mm -hmm. that he did them. But the fact of the matter is, if he is found to be insane, he could walk. In, oh, yeah. Say 10 years. He goes five. into a mental hospital, and he must be periodically re-examined. And if someone finds him along the way sane... Which must... he's already shown himself to be, or yeah. able to fake sanity at any time. See, let me just tell you this, that um, insanity is no longer a medical term. They don't speak about insanity any more than they talk about someone as being crazy. They talk about specific psychoses or schizophrenia... Mm. Insanity is only a legal term now, and only for the purpose of trying to determine what was in a criminal's mind at the time he committed the murder, and did he know that it was wrong. And my point is that there are no scientific tests to determine that. Psychiatry is not a science. At its best, it's a kind of an art form. But there are no scientific tests to determine what someone was thinking or what they might do in the future and there are no real scientific tests to determine if someone's lying or telling the truth. Except, of course, for the amazing Kreskin. <laughs> he's the only guy. He's the only well, guy. He's the amazing if you can Kreskin. get him at every case. But, but it's tough. But I see, he's booked all over, the, all over the country. I feel that the insanity defense does not belong in these cases because the, the results are too confusing. You take the jury in Milwaukee. They found Jeffrey Dahmer, who had committed all of those terrible crimes, mm -hmm. sane. They found him. His plea was guilty but insane now a jury found him sane and the reason they found him sane was because they knew very well as you said mark that if they had found him insane he would have gone to a mental hospital instead of a maximum security prison and maybe walked and maybe point. walked now if he is found sane then they have a shot at the death uh, penalty not in milwaukee though see uh... dahmer was never facing a death penalty. there are thirty three states that have the death penalty right now and uh, 21 of them are by lethal injection. Uh, instead, you know, a lot of most people in this country now favor the death penalty, about 70 to 80 percent. But then, when you ask them, you want to see someone go to the chair or the gas chamber, then they back off a little because it's it is like cruel and unusual mm -hmm. punishment. Mm -hmm. When you talk about lethal injection, though, then the percentage goes back up. At the beginning of the film, the first thing you see is this story is based on truths. Yeah. What? There was an actual case in 1978 in Sacramento that this film is based on, uh, and it follows the outlines of that case very closely. My God. The guy's name was Richard Chase. It was a celebrated... He was the boy next door, everything you said, and that, that's what happened. One of the things about the film, and again, we talked about this a bit earlier, it does go into the courtroom at some point, and you will have a chance yourself as a, a human being to... Uh, draw your own line as far as mm -hmm. what is insanity, what is guilty, what is murder, what is what is. Uh, but one of the things as a director, as a fan of film that I enjoyed was the fact that you didn't get really gory with it. Whenever you did show, say, a body part, it was a very quick snap to where mm -hmm. you couldn't even tell what it was. And it isn't gory from the standpoint of watching him do what he did. You simply derived from what the police said and from what 
the sound effects that you were given and the scenario that you were placed inside of, and then it's left up to your own imagination as to what he was doing. I'd like to make an observation here, if I could. Yes. Your voice sounds like the girl in Exorcist. <laughs> you have a cold or something? Or something going yes, on I right do. There? I'm sorry, I do. Then you got to decide what he did. And then if he's been guilty, he walks. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, when uh, I... When screw we... your king. <laughs> <laughs> when we did the television version of that uh, about 10 or so years ago, I dubbed some of the demon voice. Uh, Mercedes wasn't around, so you I, did. Yeah. Now there's. You know, also... we had to change the words, but I, I still kept a close up on her face while she was saying some of the most outrageous things. Yeah. But we changed the words, and so I, I dubbed some of that. Did you tie yourself to a chair and drink Jack Daniels and smoke? <laughs> no, I didn't need to. I had it inside of me <laughs> by go. then. Yeah, I, I, I did wonder as I've watched the movie on several occasions. I wondered how many tracks you had going because I heard a lot. as she would speak. I heard breathing. I heard wheezing, and I heard like two or three voices, which, as you described, Mercedes yeah. was able to do that. Mm -hmm. That came out of her cracked voice. It, it was cracked so far, it cracked into three parts. You know, I wish there was an Academy Award for best vocal performance on a, on a film like that, because mm -hmm. she, she was frightening in her performance mm -hmm. that she put out there. Yeah. Brian? Hello. You're on the air with William Friedkin. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Who do you who, Mark and Brian? Who do you? Hey, uh, good morning, William. How are you, Brian? Uh, very good, thank you. Sir. Good. Um, I must say, I... Uh, after all the years and this morning listening to you in the interview on the radio this morning, uh, I can never forget um, what that film did to me personally. Uh, at the time, I was about 16 when I saw it, and uh, like I said, listening to you guys talk about it this morning, in the course of that, oh, 10 or 10 and a half months, whatever it was that you said that to, to make the movie, yeah. did you have any inclination, any idea what kind of impact this movie would have on the moviegoers? None whatsoever. You know, I was not um, uh, raised as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not now a Catholic, but I, I got very interested in the religion and in, uh, you know, in studying it. And um, so, and I, and I certainly was very moved by Catholicism, but I really didn't know the impact it would have on people. And as I, as I mentioned to the guys, when we first screened it, there, there was nothing that you could see. Mm -hmm. The audience was just, you know, almost comatose. Yeah. So, no, I didn't know. It, and it truly was an amazing thing. You know, I, I was about 16, like I said, mm -hmm. and I'm well enough aware at that age that this is a movie, this is not real. But, William, I got to tell you, I, I was at the point where I went home that night I, honest to God, could not sleep. You and I should have gotten together, dude. I tell you what, honest to God, guys, you know, it really was, when we're talking about it, I listened to you this morning, it brings back that same kind of tingly feeling mm -hmm. that I had. And even to this day, when I hear the, the song, uh, what is it, Tubular Bell? Yeah. yeah. When I hear that to this day, it makes me stop and get a cringe. I mean, that was truly an incredible movie-making process. Well, I, I got something for you, Brian. I'm sorry? I got something for you. What's that? Mary. <laughs> Stop it, William. You're driving me crazy. Yeah. Well, look at the time. Well, we've got to go. Oh, by the time didn't show a thing, but we've got to go now. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I cut it off. I cut it You know, he brings up a good point in that um, uh, he said that he, he had to tell himself, it's just a movie, it's just a movie, but... The first thing I heard about The Exorcist was, and this is perhaps why I won't see it, it's based on a true story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As that, is Rampage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, see? Um, that there's that kind of evil and that kind of happening out there. Well, see, now let me give you, for me, with Rampage, what was so unsettling, and that Rampage was based on a truth. It was also showing how a psychotic individual who was capable of the things that he was doing was also, for the most part, for 99% of his day, a perfectly sane, working, boy next door, loved by everyone, and just mm -hmm. periodically he's got to go do what he has to go do. And whether he knows whether it's right or wrong at the time he's doing it, that was what was unsettling. Somebody can knock on your door, you can work with someone, you can be a buddy pal with someone and simply mm -hmm. not know what's happening inside their brain. Lisa? Yes? You're on the air. Oh, hi. Hi, hi Mark and Brian. How hi. Are you? Um, I have a question for Bill about the exorcist. Yeah. When Linda Blair um, did the scene where she was throwing up on the priest, Yeah. how did... How did you get all that throw-up to come out of her? Okay, well, she had a facial mask, and inside the mask we concealed, a, on the side that was away from the camera, a little tube that ran from um, uh, down her side uh, all the way down to the foot of the bed, and, uh, and up through the bed, up to her side, right next to her mouth, concealed in, in, the, in her makeup, and the, the substance was pumped 
through uh, through that tube and came out of her... It looked like it was coming out of her mouth, yeah. but it, in fact, was not coming out of her mouth. And contrary to a lot of popular opinion, it's not split pea soup. It uh, was, it's it's what was oatmeal. It? Well, I was 10 years uh, old when I... Colored oatmeal? It. Color, oh, it's the color of split pea soup. So it was just a movie. It's just a movie. Hmm. I told you, Brian. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I tell you how some people... The, uh, when we remixed the film into stereo, Lisa, uh, uh, about ten years or so ago, it originally did not come out in stereo. There wasn't stereo. I spent about two months remixing the picture into stereo. And I really worked on the soundtrack very carefully. And we went out and they re-released it in like first-run theaters. Mm -hmm. And I went to a theater in New York after working on it for a long time to remix. And I, as I was going up the steps of this th multiplex where the, the, the film was playing, I heard weird noises coming out of the theater. Noises I never heard, but it didn't sound like The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. I got to the, when I got up to the, to the curtains to go in, th there was the odor of marijuana like I've never... <laughs> <laughs> and opened, yeah. I opened the curtains, and there was an entire audience um, <laughs> of people... and. All these noises were like they had radios playing in the theater. There were 40 or 50 radios. People had their children on their shoulders. They were talking throughout the theater. They were talking back to the screen. And it was, <laughs> it was by that time, you see, after 10 years, people were not e experiencing the exorcist so much. They just wanted to be in the room with it. Yeah. And it was no longer frightening to them. It they was. made it like a like you see the Rocky Horror yeah. Picture Show. Yeah. Well, I was ten years old when I saw it, and it wow. scared me to death. And I still have nightmares over. Ten it. years old. Ten. Well, my parents were. You would have to know them. And yeah, I would hope. And <laughs> they let me watch it, and I couldn't sleep for hours. Yeah. I mean, you know the fellow for, who I mean, played years. the fellow who played uh, Father Karras, the Exorcist. I used to walk down a street with him. Uh, in New York, for example, and he couldn't go four or five blocks without people coming up to him and starting to tell him about their daughter and this and that and ask Ooh. him to come and do something. And he used to say, I'm just an actor. You know, I'm only an actor. I'm not well, a priest. I thought I was possessed for a while. You thought you were possessed? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I, Every time what I symptoms did you have? Excuse me? Did you have any symptoms? Well, I always thought that the bed was moving, <laughs> and I, uh -huh. I always go, would scream for my mom, I'm possessed. <laughs> but, oh, that's um, the effect. Can wow. I have a question for Mark and Brian? Yep. My daughter missed school today so that she could tell you a spooky joke. Mm-hmm. And she wants, uh, well, she says it's funny, spooky joke. And she wants to tell you just one joke. Okay, put her on. She, all right, hold on. Sweet. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Veronica. Hi, Veronica. You have a joke? Mm-hmm. Can we hear it? What did the mummy say after he saw the case? What did the mummy say after he saw the case? Uh huh. We don't know what. Well, that wraps up the place. Great. <laughs> that wraps Can up the place. The oh, cool. Yeah. What's that, Veronica? Can we get the tickets? Ah, uh, yes, Nick. <laughs> hey, uh, Veronica, do you know what the skeleton said or why the skeleton couldn't cross the road? Because he. <laughs> you didn't have the guts for it. All right, Veronica. <laughs> yes, you can have the tickets. Absolutely. Hang nice. on. <laughs> okay. Nice. Hang on, Veronica. <laughs> All right. Uh, we will uh, take this one quick station break. We, we do want to come back and uh, maybe wrap up the conversation with a bit of Rampage and, uh, and talk about the new... Well, Rampage is your new film that opens today. And the only way that I can see The Exorcist, and I've just discovered this as we sit here, is to come over to your house, mm -hmm. sit next to you on the couch, and everything that's happened... Okay, now this is how we did this, Brian. <laughs> There's tubes. You know what? There's fixed stuff. Bring I don't a radio. You, I don't think you can see it then. <laughs> it, it, it... Since you have not seen it, and knowing how you deal with these kind of films, I don't think you could sit through it. Your voice is scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm saying, I don't think you could sit through you it. You either sound like an all-star wrestler or the girl in Exorcist. <laughs> I don't think you could sit through it. I, when I get him in Bowling, I'm going to take him down off the top uh, rope and get him arm smash. I would love to show it to you, yeah. but I don't, know that you could, I don't know you could hang. There's a lot of very oh. psychotically intense stuff. Going over to Bill's house. <laughs> um, one of the callers... Uh, a couple of days ago, Bill called up and said he had heard that there were subliminal messages being planted in the film The Exorcist. Like every two scenes or, or every two uh, seconds, something would pop up that we didn't really see, uh, think we saw, but we subliminally saw. Totally false. There are subliminal cuts in the film. But you can see them. I made up a dream sequence in which I tried to unite things that happened to one of the priests who was in Iraq... 
I put things that happened to him and that he saw into the dream of Father Karras, who was living in Georgetown, who right. had not met Father Marin, because I had this idea that, you know, how do dreams come to us? Uh, they come in the unconscious, but maybe things that happen to somebody that you're very close to or are going to be close to and thinking about, maybe incidents in their life can turn up in your dream. I mean, who, who knows? It, symbiosis, you know? Mm -hmm. So I took little, uh, ex experimentally, I took little three-frame cuts mm. of things from the Iraq sequence. Time-wise, three frames would be... Well, it's an eighth of a second. You can see Tw them, though. Twenty-four mm. frames per second is one second of film. There are 24 of those little postage stamp size frames running through a projector equal one second of film. So two or three frames is a twelfth of a second, mm -hmm. an eighth of a second, which the human eye does not perceive very well. But sometimes in not perceiving them well, you perceive them better because they flip into your imagination. Yeah. So I and then use, you take it from there. That's right. Yeah. I use short little cuts in that one scene only, and some of the cuts that are the ones that people freak out on are from a makeup test that we did of, of, <laughs> uh, of a girl that we were trying the makeup on. It was not Linda Blair. It was just white-faced makeup, mm -hmm. and I didn't like the makeup in that test, and I never used it in the film. But when you looked at it, two, three frames of it, right. it was really shocking. Plus, it looked like you double exposed at one point. When she, that was an accident in the camera. When cool. The, when the film was running out of the camera, wow. you sometimes get more than one frame on a, uh, on a uh, more than one image on one frame. It worked. I put those frames that normally you throw away into the film. There are no messages. I mean, it's not like. Uh, it says, drink Coca-Cola or right. some damn thing. There, there are no messages uh, or, any, Doritos. or Doritos or anything else. Now, there have been books written that have suggested that that's what we did. But these are obviously scholars whose head is up their own, you but. know. And uh, so... Uh, that, so no that, little messages like William freaking rules. No, th th but that message has gone out there. Now there are certain things like that in the film Cruising as well that we can't talk about on this family type show. Hmm, there are little there are, but again, no messages to get people to buy something or do so. That, you know, mm -hmm. advertising does those. Right. Uh, they right. did that for a while until that was outlawed by mm -hmm. the FCC. Mm -hmm. They would put buy Coke or drink Coke. Yeah, or into a story that you're watching on TV. All of a sudden, there's two frames that tell you what to go out and buy. Did you, have you seen Jacob's Ladder? Yeah, mm -hmm. they, liked it. They did yeah. a lot of that kind of thing. Maybe it wasn't a, an eighth of a second, but mm -hmm. uh, those quick cuts scared the hell out of me. Oh, yeah. That's, that's an interesting picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know... Um, with the work that you've already put out for us to see with The Exorcist and uh, The French Connection, and, and then other films like Deal of the Century and so forth, uh, it appears as though you specialize and that you particularly enjoy the kind of film that is a bit controversial, that does throw things on the screen that maybe other people haven't dealt with in a real, realistic situation. Is there a project? Is there something that you still uh, yearn to do, uh, a certain kind of film that you yet want to put out? Well, the script that I'm working on now uh, is being written by a, a very good writer called Steve Shagan, who wrote The Formula, and he wrote uh, Save the Tiger, which Jack Lemmon won an mm -hmm. Oscar for. He's writing a script for me now that's set in contemporary Los Angeles, and it's called Sacred Ground. And it really uh, deals with all of the different um, communities that are happening here now, you know, the, the changes that are, that are not all that um, easily perceived in modern-day Los Angeles. It's kind of a Chinatown story in that it's about, uh, as Chinatown was about w what was happening here in the 30s, this is about today in the 90s, but it's kind of dark and strange and, and exotic. You'll see Los Angeles, I think, as you haven't seen it before. Mm. That's, that's an interesting one, and I, I'm hoping to do that um, this coming year. Bill, since we're into Bob Coburn's time, Bob I'm Coburn sorry. is here. No, 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 no. He has a trivia question for you from the French Connection. Okay. This is Bob Coburn. First of all, nice to meet you, Mr. It's Friedman. a pleasure, uh, Bob. Secondly, it has you. been uh, intellectually stimulating and somewhat scary this morning, but the scariest thing of all is seeing Nicole's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> from the pumpkin kettle Whoa. thing. Thing? She was yeah. stomping through mud. Yeah. There's mud on her shoes. <laughs> Those are indescribable. Those actually look like a victim's shoes. They uh, really do, yeah. yes. Uh, <laughs> we pulled him out of the lake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I had heard, back to the French Connection uh, briefly, uh, the role went to Gene Hackman. It mm -hmm. turned out to be a career-making role for him. It really broke him big time. I heard the role was offered to Peter uh, Boyle. 
first. Exactly. That is Not true. only that, we, I, I wanted Jackie Gleason originally. He was my first choice. I wanted a big, heavy-set Irish guy, you know, uh, a kind of a thundercloud that could either weep or kill. Yeah. But, had, you know, the, like an Irish guy who would, would sing the old songs and tears roll down his cheeks, then the next day he'd go out and, and, and break up some uh, black bar. Um, I wanted Gleason, but the studio uh, just didn't want to go for that then. They wanted an unknown guy. I then Peter Boyle had just made the film Joe, right, and, right. and he turned it down. Peter Boyle turned it down. He said, I want to play romantic leads. I said, with a head like that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he, he didn't find that funny. But, so then, nope. <laughs> then, have you ever heard of a, of a newspaper guy in New York named Jimmy Breslin? Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Jimmy yeah, Breslin right. then became... The perfect guy. He had never acted in a film. He was this newspaper columnist, heavy set, dark Irish guy. And I rehearsed Jimmy Breslin for three weeks. And we improvised a lot of the dialogue. I had some other actors that I had cast. And I'd get Jimmy doing this stuff. And it was extraordinary. Um, and one day he would be great, then the next day he'd forget what he was doing. The day after that, he, he, he didn't know where he was. So he could never sustain it as an actor could. Um, but then finally he came to me when he knew it wasn't going well. He said, I got to tell you something. I don't drive a car either. You know, he said, I promised my mother on her deathbed I'd never drive. And of course, you got to drive French in the French Connection. Yeah. So, <laughs> there you go. But he would have gotten the role. Gene Hackman was about the last choice to do it. And he's one of the greatest actors in America. But yeah. at that time, he had not done a, a lead role, and I just didn't see him for this. Yeah, it really broke his career. It really broke. broke there is a movie god because or who watches over us, because the guy who played the French guy, too, is not the actor I wanted. Th th do you have a second? I'll tell you about that. I, the, the other question I was going to ask oh, was, go ahead. would you guys not stop? No, no, it's, <laughs> no, 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 no you're great. Yeah, as long as he wants to stay. No, but yeah. the, the guy who going. played the French guy in the French Connection, we, we used to, the guys I worked with, we talked to each other in very quick, the way you guys talk, where you can finish each other's sentences. Right. Mm. That's how I talk with the people who work with me. And, I said to the casting director, you know, I want that French guy who was in Belle de Jour, that French movie Belle de Jour. That's the guy I want. Yeah. So, okay. So he went out, and he said, we got that guy. His name is, I didn't know his name. He said, his name is Fernando Ray, and uh, he's, uh, he's available. He speaks a little English. He'll be great. So they made a deal with him and signed him, and I went out to LaGuardia Airport to pick him up when he came in to, to this country to do the part. And I, I'm looking for, I, I don't see the guy I have in mind. I, and then I get paged. Mr. Friedkin, come to the United Airlines. I go to the desk, and there's this other guy who I had seen in other films. It's Fernando Ray, but it's not the guy from Belle de Jour. Oh, my God. It's a guy with a little goatee, and he's a very distinguished-looking guy. And I wanted a, the, the guy I had in mind, uh, his name was Francisco Rabal, who was rough. He was a guy from Corsica tough looking guy and here's Fernando Ray a little guy with a goatee and so I'm driving him back to the hotel <laughs> and I, I got the wrong guy <laughs> and I, I'm saying you know you, you, you know the, the goatee I, I don't know uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and he said oh I could never shave that he said you don't want me to shave that he said that would be a horror film he said I've got stuff all over my chin I use this to cover it uh, oh, my God. And I get him to the hotel, check him in, and I ran over the phone. And I called the producer and the casting director. I said, we got the wrong guy. This isn't the right guy. He said, what you, that's Fernando. I said, no. The guy, this is not the guy. They find out the guy I wanted was Francisco Rabal. It turned out that Francisco Rabal, who was the guy from Belle de Jour, spoke no English and was not available. And couldn't drive a car. Right? <laughs> right, right, right. So we had to go with that guy, Fernando Ray. We had, a, we had to adapt the role to what he could do, and he was wonderful. I love these kind of stories. You sure his name wasn't Dominique? <laughs> Very much like a Dominique story. Uh, all right, listen. Uh, from a standpoint of those who enjoy this particular kind of film, uh, William Freak and the guy you've heard talk for the last hour does have a new film that opens today. Uh, in fact, the first showing should be in about an hour, 11 o'clock. The film is called Rampage. It goes inside of the head of a psychotic killer that um, is sane, or maybe not. You are the one that will make up your mind. You will also be taken into the courtroom and make a decision on your own. What would you have done if you were a juror? I haven't seen the very end of the film. I think I have about maybe 10 to 15 minutes left to go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well made, well acted, 
good story, and based on truths. And the jury dies at the end. Yes, all of them. <laughs> you will enjoy this movie. It is a William Friedkin production written and directed by William. This is a decision we're going to have to learn to make in the 90s as well. Yeah. This this is real life now. What yeah. What is the legal definition of when, when you're no longer in control and uh, aware of what you're doing. Also, mm -hmm. for those of you that need a familiar actor or face to uh, grab a hold of for the film, the guy that was in Terminator, the first Terminator, the guy that turned out to be uh, uh, the young Good boy's guy. father, mm -hmm. uh, he is the star. He is the lead actor in this film. Michael Bean. And who is the psychotic killer? His name is Alex MacArthur, and he's wonderful. I had never seen him act before I hired him. He was in a Madonna video. He was the guy in Papa Don't Preach, who is supposedly the father of her child. And you just been, liked the look? I liked his look. Wow. He didn't know, but, and I liked the way he looked, and then I, he had, uh, he was a very handsome guy, boy next door. I met him, and here was this intelligent guy, and I put him together with a lot of people who had that affliction. You see, William, the thing of it is, and we were talking about how you put things on the screen that bother people. It wasn't just the fact that this guy went in as the boy next door and murdered his next door neighbors. I cringed, I, and I don't cringe much, but when he walked in the kitchen and he was going to do the lady, her little boy was sitting at the table. And that, said that is the line where William Friedkin draws, where he does things that a lot of people won't do. Now, he didn't show the little boy being taken care of, but just the thought patterns that are there that you will go through. If you enjoy this kind of film, Rampage is for you. It is out. It starts today. You, if you enjoy horror, if you enjoy the psychotic thriller, if you enjoy a courtroom drama, this film is for you. They're talking about it. Critics are digging it. Thanks a lot. Good luck with it. What hey, a pleasure man. to be here. What hey, a pleasure to get inside the mind of you, the director. Yeah, you, you guys are great. Well, come back and continue listening. And Freeway Love Connection for your 10-year-old is a set deal. All right. We're doing this, it. We'll call you next week. Yeah. Give me a number <laughs> you know, I can get him through. That's his. <laughs> that's a fabulous idea. We'll yeah. do it. We'll start it with your son. Okay. And, and then we'll do it every few weeks or so. Yeah. Yeah. 10-year-old okay. Freeway Love Connection. <laughs> Give him some Disney World tickets. Or you can go over to William's house and see Deep Throat. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a big fan of the show, as yeah. am I. Thank you very Thanks. much for coming in. Thank really you. Cool. So cool. Thanks, Mark and Brian. All right. Now, again, if you want to add to your uh, list of videos you want to rent for the weekend and scare yourself if you haven't seen the exorcist in a long time pick it up if you've never seen ishtar it too is frightening so uh yeah. grab a <laughs> you copy go. and enjoy Ooh. <laughs> oh never never um uh we, we we end the show with this um and we hope that if anything get anything out of this show it's it's this do not drink and drive this is a very fun weekend for both young and old. Yeah. You're going to be at a lot of parties, you, uh, you adults, and uh, we ask you to either you know, put a sleeping bag in your car and take it in with you when you feel you drunk too much, but just don't drink and drive. And if you're a youngin' and say mom and dad are going to be out, they're going to go to a party or whatnot, and you want to go trick-or-treating, you might want to call some friends and go uh, trick-or-treating in a big group. Ten to fifteen kids is always safe. It's always fun, more fun than by yourself. And, uh, and just enjoy and be safe. Uh, it's a real good time to watch your neighbor, too. If you're a single person who you don't really enjoy giving candy away alone because it's kind of a drag for you, get out in your car. Just walk around your neighborhood uh, during trick-or-treating time. A very happy Halloween to you all. Chuck Jones Monday. Oh, Chuck Jones. Oh, my God. He had a couple of horror cartoons, too, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> get off this. Yeah, Chuck Jones again. He was uh, one of our first guests th five years ago, mm -hmm. and he's, he's going to be back. Okay, gang, a real happy Halloween. Thank you very much for listening. We will return Monday morning with Aladdin tickets and Chick Show tickets. Yeah, be good to each other, you guys. Have a good Halloween. 95.5 KLOS Los Angeles. And this is